Hello, and welcome to the first Fission Tech Talk of 2022. Uh, today, we are going to hear about Open Lunar, uh, and uh, Jesse Kate Shingler is here to explain what Open Lunar is all about. And I think we're also going to get into some things like public goods and open data. Um, and my friend uh, Robert Douglas uh, wants to take the Open Goldberg Variations music recordings to the moon. So perhaps we'll talk about that as well. Uh, welcome, Jesse. Thank you very much, Boris. Um, okay, so today what I was thinking of doing is talking about um, like what's actually happening on the moon these days and giving some context about that. Then a brief introduction to Open Lunar and what we do, and then share uh, some thinking about basically coordination questions and opportunities that I think are shared between uh, the outer space and Web3 communities. And then we can just open it up for discussion. And I'm, uh, I'm really curious what you all are thinking about uh, some of these overlapping topics. Awesome. Great. Um, so I don't have slides, so I'm just going to sort of um, roll with it and um, we can pull up resources as we need. Perfect. Um, but so just to set some context, uh, what's going on around the moon? There's uh, a few single missions internationally that have been to the moon in the last, say, 20 years, very few. Um, and they're mostly science missions sent by governments or all science missions sent by governments. Uh, right now we've got um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter in orbit around the moon that's been mapping, uh, mapping the moon since 2009. Um, and we have a Chinese mission on the far side of the moon, not the dark side, the far side, uh, that is also roving on the surface um, to study a local area of the moon. And it's actually the first mission to have landed on the far side. Uh, and so it uses a relay satellite that um, allows it to communicate back to earth. Um, and then there's a, a Indian satellite in orbit um, called Chandrayaan-2 um, that's doing some remote sensing and scientific activities as well. Um, but that's pretty much it um, for what's what's there right now. The moon itself uh, is pretty barren, as probably most of us know. It's great for science of the early solar system. It's hard to live on. So to live or just stay there, even for extended periods of time, uh, will be much more feasible if we can use some resources locally rather than taking everything from Earth because launch is expensive. But the resources are fairly sparse and Although we have a lot of remote sensing information, we don't have a lot of ground truth or detailed concentration information about those resources. We have learned that there's definitely water ice on the moon. We just don't know where it is exactly or really how to extract and process it. We know at a coarse level. So then about 10 years ago, NASA set up a program. It was a new program uh, to do a lot of its lunar science not by sending landers and spacecraft itself, but, but by purchasing rides on commercial landers. And this turned a large number of commercial lunar lander companies who were offering payload space, both to government, but also privately to academics, engineers, enterprising initiatives, crazy people like us. And then in 2019, NASA's Artemis program came along which uh, has plans to, as probably most people have heard, return uh, to the moon with humans, including the first woman for the first time since the Apollo program. And this year alone, there's about 10 missions going to the moon. There's uh, in the category of landers, <clears throat> there's two missions from a company called Intuitive Machines and uh, one from a company called Astrobotic. These are uh, both um, American companies. There's a mission from a company in Japan called iSpace. Uh, and then there's a mission called Chandrayaan-3 from India and one from Russia called Luna 25. And all of these um, commercial missions have payloads from a variety, often tens of different organizations and all have instruments that are aimed at looking at natural resources, mostly understanding the presence of water ice, which we need to do pretty much anything on the moon. In the category of orbiters, we have a mission called Capstone that's basically studying the properties of um, orbits around Lagrange points, which are a really neat um, orbital phenomenon. Uh, we have um, a mission called Con 1, which will be a communications relay satellite demo, basically. Korea is sending an orbiter 
And there's even a crypto project um, called Doge One that is ostensibly going up at the end of Q1. Um, it, I think it's not crypto in sort of operations, but it's and uh, it will have some some sensors on it. It's a bit ambiguous, which makes me wonder if it's going to go up at all. But you know, we shall see. The vast majority of these activities are commercial, maybe not by dollars invested, uh, but by distinct actors. And many of the landers uh, that are going that I just listed have rovers on them as payloads, and those rovers have instruments from different parties. So we can see the number of operators and the complexity of operations, liabilities, permission, and the need for norms and rules of the road will grow very quickly. The fascinating thing is that this is all happening in an environment that's been legally constructed as a domain outside the reach of traditional sovereignty. <clears throat> what I mean by that is that there is a legal framework there's a treaty called the Outer Space Treaty that prohibits, quote, national appropriation. And it requires, quote, free access to all areas of celestial bodies. And importantly, it also says no nukes and no military installations on the surface of other celestial bodies. But basically, a lot of the structures in, in, and institutions, sorry, on which our coordination as a species rests today, systems of property, rights, flows of accountability and permissions, who can say yes and no to what, these just haven't been built up yet. So it's not a total wild west. I don't, I don't love that term because there are a set of treaties that govern this domain. And there are basic mechanisms in place, for example, to approve launches and their payloads, planetary protection rules, registration commitments, et cetera. But there are tons of unanswered questions as well. Mostly what the treaties say is what we can't do. And they are big things we can't do. They essentially rule out Westphalian sovereignty and a lot of follow on tools from that regime. But they don't tell us how we should do it instead, which is probably a good thing. I don't think we'd want a bunch of folks from <clears throat> 1967 telling us how we should do things today. Um, the idea of having to build up new rules and a new operating environment is probably not unfamiliar to folks in the DWeb and crypto communities, but uh, let's say it's very foreign to people in DC or the UN. So while that means we don't have a basis for things like real property, <clears throat> i.e. no, you can't just go and put a stake on a you know, plot of land on the moon. And if somebody tries to sell you one, don't buy it. Uh, and nobody knows if you land somewhere, even how long you can stay or whether you have obligations to anyone else. It's also an opportunity for reinvention, if we can carve out the space for some prefiguration. So this is where Open Lunar comes in. We come from Silicon Valley roots, uh, but we work very hard to be international in our execution and our operation. I'm just gonna drink some water here. Uh, this is amazing. Don't don't uh, let the, the <laughs> silence uh, trick you. Uh, I'm taking notes in the background, I'm loving it. <laughs> There's so many interesting threads to unpack here. So thank you so much. Great. Yeah, take notes. And uh, also, I'm not really watching the chat. So if you have questions, just like, just speak up. <clears throat> um, right. Okay. So this is where Open Lunar comes in. Um, we come mostly from backgrounds in technology uh, and environmental science. And we saw all this activity happening. And given our understanding of the power that technology has to make the impossible suddenly possible, we noted with some concern that <clears throat> no one was focusing on at least ensuring that we have conversations about setting precedents in this environment with some intention. For us, that means creating the groundwork for openness and cooperation at the core of lunar activities. It also means looking for new forms of agency that respond to diverse stakeholder interests. We support emerging commercial activity but we wanna see it qualified by good practices, stewardship and long-term thinking. And now is definitely the time when we need to introduce these things because as we know, it's not gonna happen later. So yes, kind of as, a, sort of, as, a, as a trope, essentially yes. it's like, let's not accidentally create the tragedy of the commons or, or let's not assume that tragedy is the outcome but actually work on a commons. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and exactly. And that, you know, it's always the question of <clears throat> too soon or too late um, is a really delicate one. And so it is kind of, you know, it's like, you could say this is a Goldilocks zone, right? Of course, everybody wants <clears throat> these things. The question of course is how, um, but it's also worth saying, I guess, that not everyone supports, for example, the development of commercial activity on the moon. Some people think we should be focused on scientific uh, or at least non-commercial activity only, which is a totally legitimate conversation to be having. Do we want that? And those things are, those precedents are being set now. <clears throat> Nation states, you know, countries are um, slowly but surely adopting national policies that, that support um, and allow for that. So um, anyway, bes besides being the only think tank focused exclusively on the moon, I'd say maybe the thing which differentiates us in particular is that we're pretty squarely grounded in philosophies of self-organization. We come from backgrounds in autonomous and um, collaborative networks, intentional communities, and, and facilitation. So I'd like to think this complements the more traditional world of think tanks. We also see the moon as an opportunity to create like a petri dish or a template for important areas that we need to innovate on earth, mostly around, as you were just saying, Boris, uh, global commons management um, and human coordination outside traditional state processes and institutions. Uh, I gave a TED talk on this a couple of years ago, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about that here, but um, I'll share the link to it later on. Um, so things we do, basically um, bread and butter policy work. We do policy advocacy to governments and industry. <clears throat> we can mean dialogues. We have a project called The Moon Dialogues, uh, which is online, international, and interdisciplinary, and hosts salons on different aspects of lunar governance and coordination that they're public um, and open to all. <clears throat> We're also a permanent observer to uh, the UN's Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or COPUS, as it's called, which just set up a new working group on space resources uh, after about five years of folks um, making calls for this. So to be a permanent observer to the UN basically means as an NGO, you apply, you give a sort of like talk um, in front of the committee members. Uh, and if you don't say anything too political, then people across the spectrum approve your application. And then you get to sort of sit in on the meetings and give statements on agenda items. <clears throat> so uh, over the last few years, we have developed essentially a policy platform for lunar activities. What we think the key values are, as well as what the important topics are that we will need to address in the near future. For us, this involves a few key themes. Uh, the first is stakeholder-led governance, bringing together people who care about an issue and encouraging them to develop endogenous coordination mechanisms amongst themselves or ourselves. The second is polycentricity. This means independent but overlapping centers of governance. The third is subsidiarity, uh, which is um, a fancy word that means to solve problems at the most local level possible, commensurate with their resolution. Uh, and the fourth is stewardship. So essentially it's a very common Z kind of approach. And we use this to propose and to inform discussions about important questions that don't have institutions or coordination practices in place yet, like landing sites, salvage rights, or water ice extraction. But as technologists, it's also very much in our blood, uh, the idea of being an action, uh, to be an actor in order to have a seat at the table is sort of like at the core of our philosophy. <clears throat> and this maps back to um, you know, our values to roll up our sleeves, to get involved, and to focus on stakeholder-driven coordination. So, um, as we mature, we're positioning ourselves more and more to work with missions and operators to fly with them, to support existing operators by being a customer, first of all, uh, which helps develop you know, the economy, and to develop physical and conceptual payloads that advance certain precedents. So this idea of precedent setting through conceptual payloads and activities is encapsulated in uh, what we like to call, or the, the term we like to use for this is policy demos. So it's kind of like a tech demo, 
but we're prototyping policy solutions that we think are good ideas, but we wanna try them out in order to understand how they perform, how they affect incentives, what we can learn from it, and then iterate from there, rather than going straight to say advocating for like a national uh, policy to be adopted. <clears throat> so last year, we did our first major project along these lines, and it's called Breaking Ground. And we basically set up um, a legal trust in order to buy lunar regolith. A regolith is basically lunar soil. Uh, we set up a legal trust to buy lunar regolith in place from commercial operators going to the moon this year. And it's a super cool kind of trust that's called a perpetual purpose trust. And this trust is legally accountable to the purpose statement of the trust itself. So it's a bit like a charitable trust in that it has a mission and you know the trustees are fiduciarily responsible to that mission, except it doesn't have to be charitable, but the trustees are still fiduciarily responsible. So a little bit like a B Corp that is supposed to put its mission uh, above uh, shareholder interests. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, exactly. And some of these things are Americanisms. So we need to talk about them conceptually rather than just within the legal framework of the United States. Indeed. Um, although, tr you know, trusts, I guess, are, are pretty much in all jurisdictions. And, and that's, you know, the difference between a company and a trust is the trust is, is stewarding. So it doesn't even have as its purpose to uh, make a profit necessarily. Um, but it, the trustees of that trust are legally responsible to this mission. Um, in our case, the mission is uh, to, I'm just going to read the, the sort of formal mission here, to steward and demonstrate formal and effective institutional management of lunar resources between different stakeholders. So we've sort of created this legal entity as a platform to try out policy demos. And what we'll do with the regular we buy, I think, yeah, somebody sent me to. That's the so Vancouver SkyTrain. Uh, <laughs> Steven, I, I muted you and uh, just go ahead and, and uh, unmute later when you're not on the SkyTrain. Nice. Um, okay, so uh, we have this trust um, that's a sort of you know creative legal endeavor and we're gonna buy some regolith and we're gonna per put that regolith into the trust. And first of all, that involved working with a bunch of lawyers who obviously had never set, you know, put together a contract for buying regolith since nobody even knows what makes it legal to buy regolith in the first place or in what jurisdictions you can do this in. Um, and then we have to figure out, well, what do we wanna do with the regolith when we buy it? Um, it? Currently our plan is to start off by using it to prototype approaches to, um, first of all, to data sharing. <clears throat> so there's broad stroke sort of guidance about scientific data sharing in, um, in outer space activities. Uh, but no specifics, again, on what differentiates commercial data from scientific data. Um, and there are also um, sort of, again, broad strokes, uh, sort of commitment to notification of activities uh, or, or uh, safety zones, keep out zones, uh, very sensitive, very political. Nobody knows how to implement these things yet. Uh, so we figure what we could do is with our regolith, when we buy it, one of the things we might do is, is basically assert a notification zone around that regolith. And to be clear, we're talking about, we call it a teaspoon of regolith. It's probably like, you know, 25 or 50 grams. So it's not dramatic, it's a, it's a demo, right? It's like, what's the MVP of this activity? Um, and anyway, so we figure we should try it out, see how it works. So this was one of our big projects last year. Um, so, okay, now we're coming to public goods because the thing about coming up with governance and coordination mechanisms for the lunar environment is that because there's no traditional sovereignty, the question of who gets to have a say in any given topic, who gets to decide to approve uh, a given approach, none of that is really clear. And the default ends up for being that things flow back to the United Nations, but the UN is ill-equipped to handle policy at this speed or level of specificity, obviously. Uh, so we need new coordination mechanisms. But to do that, we constantly face this question of stakeholders, of who. So another way to think about stakeholders, especially in an environment where you don't have borders, is basically a public. 
a public is you know a group of people who share an identity or circumstances who constitute themselves in some way so as to engage in sense making together and often they create shared services or shared value say through taxes the neat thing about the lunar environment is that we actually uh, we need to or we have the opportunity to constitute this lunar public or publics plural so obviously there's a lot of overlaps again with the blockchain world here so, I, I think so much of this what you're saying actually puts me in mind of uh literally the internet um mm -hmm. and and there's this trope uh that i need to go find the 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 canonical form of it is is uh, people participate in something that they they feel they are part of a public, um, you know, um, let's say a website, a forum that they participate in, and then changes get made. And they say, yeah. why was I not consulted? Um, <laughs> and then they have to unpack the fact that, that there's, in fact, a terms of service and this space that they've been sense making with other people is, in fact, the contract that they thought they had with it, that they had shared ownership, in fact, was not. And then the other yeah. side of this is just all of the stuff about um, uh, you know, I'm getting these pings of, of, of open source, your point about legal, where, you know, one of the frameworks I like to tell people about is, um, my definition of open source, where there's the legal innovation that you have now done as well of somebody has to sit down and go, how do you make a copy left rather than copyright? Then there's the second part where a set of norms of how to collaborate together as a group often on code has evolved. And then the third is ideology, but very often people don't think critically that there are in fact three layers. Uh, at yeah, least, totally. Right. And, and yeah. this is the same thing I'm hearing. Like, I'm like, oh, we're doing the legal innovation piece. Now we have to figure out this piece. We have to fix it. And a bunch of people are going to say, why was I not consulted? Uh, uh, it's amazing. It's actually, it's perfect. Cause I have, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about open source as a, um, let's say as a reference for uh, some, as an analogy basically for some of the things that I see happening. Yeah. Uh, um, our SkyTrain friend, uh, Steven, uh, has a question that I'll, I'll read out because he's muted is, uh, Jesse, what is your take on environmental protection on other planets? There are many suggestions for radical changes to the environment uh, mm. of other planets. Yeah, good question. Um, well, the first is just to note that we do, there are basic environmental protection rules in place in um, most, that, so that's um, regulated at the national level and um, the major space bearing uh, countries all have um, basic planetary protection mechanisms in place um, in terms of their launch licensing and approval processes. Um, but it is, it is a sort of tension in terms of, you know, do you go and like dig up some area in order to um, put a landing pad there or put a, you know, an outpost there um, or do you protect it for scientific activity? Um, I think I would sort of appeal back to those um, kind of key principles that I was talking about earlier. Um, and I would say we should treat them individually as they come up. Uh, we shouldn't make a blanket rule that we, you know, uh, shouldn't tr should or shouldn't protect. Uh, I mean, we do have baseline guidance, like the planetary protection rules that NASA has has two zones on the moon, for example. Um, so it's getting more specific. It used to just be one zone, um, and now they're saying that the poles are actually need to be more protected than the equatorial regions because there's uh, more scientific records in the poles. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I think taking a kind of adaptive approach that is responsive in the short term will make a lot of sense. Um, and to make sure that we bring in people who are stakeholders in those conversations, primarily we're talking about scientists um, who know what the, those areas contain um, versus sort of other kinds of operators. Um, and then there's a, you know, a, um, I would say, I think it's important to bring in some long-term thinking as well. So to think about the exponential nature of human resource consumption um, as we begin to go to other planets and uh, and to plan for the fact that our activities will accelerate or grow um, and think ahead about that in, in any policy planning. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, I mean, I think there are some more radical ideas, maybe not that radical, which is that you could say the moon is essentially a dead planet. You know, there's not much to preserve there in terms of like, um, you know, ecosphere history, right? 
Um, so that I think I, I don't know is the short answer, um, but it's an interesting conversation to, to have. Gavin, did you wanna jump in and ask a question? Sure. I, I, hi, sorry, I was a bit late to the call, so I'm not sure if you did intro, introductions or, or, or not, but um, I'm really interested in this topic, uh, just um, background in astrophysics and ran the Open Data Institute. Um, oh, great. So, cool. um, and now running an environmental data company called Icebreaker One, um, where we're looking at awesome. climate change data and finance and what have you. So super interesting that, that, that this sort of uh, topic and, and your example I suppose my observation is the um, the theory of of some of these uh, principles from the international astronomical community uh, seems to be it moves even more slowly than the kind of UN process almost uh, the astronomical time frames maybe is the, <laughs> the framing yeah um, and I was just struck when you were talking there about um, I was just listening to another uh, talk last week where the projections of 100,000 satellites in the sky by the end of this decade. Yeah. So we're not even like the, the regulatory process of, of just managing our immediate space, never mind a little bit further away, like the moon. Um, yeah. we, we, we like it's going to be a complete shit show because there's so much money piping towards it. And obviously they're already talking about like asteroid mining and things like that, which, you know, yep. maybe one day, but so I, my question is, uh, how far have you got with this this process? So, and again, sorry if I missed a bit uh, at the beginning. Where, where, where's the sort of, where are you on your arc? Is it really at the early stages of discovery? Have you found any, like, who's in charge <laughs> kind of questions? <laughs> um, when you say the process, do you mean the process of establishing sort of like coordination mechanisms for lunar activity? In yeah, 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 yeah. So I was, that, that really piqued my interest. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah, these things are slow. I, I would say um, from, from the standpoint of the goals or the you know approach that we take, that I think of us as being in kind of a capacity building um, phase, which is, it's so nascent uh, that there's a lot of awareness building about just like what is happening on the moon or the fact like that list of missions that I, you know, rattled off at the very beginning. I don't know if you're here for, like not a lot of people have even quite like have a complete list of that, like, you know, Russian doll uh, nested set of like spacecraft and landers and rovers and pay instruments on the, you know, rovers. And um, so it's, it's actually kind of uh, we're learning, I guess, um, you know, the positive way of thinking about it is like, we're, we're just learning how to even kind of be situationally aware of what's happening there. And, uh, and then in doing that, I think we're <clears throat> trying, we're working, you know, hard to introduce language like polycentricity at the UN so that we have words to talk about, um, you know, self-organization amongst actors. Uh, so that's kind of the, I would say the, the phase that we're at, which is, um, not, we're not necessarily behind, <laughs> like we, you know, humanity, um, in the sense that these things are just starting. And so I think there is a delicate balance between, you know, beating a drum about the fact that we need coordination and giving space for, uh, folks to, to feel motivated for the need for coordination by observing, um, by observing, you know, it themselves directly. Uh, and obviously the hope is just that you don't wait so long that somebody, you know, rams into somebody else and there's some big international dispute about it. So, so, so Gavin, one of the things I want, I, I was really excited to, uh, to learn about the Open Lunar Foundation. And I'm like, amazing. Someone is thinking about open data, interoperable communications. It's not a state actor. It's not a corporate actor. Jesse's our only hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, no that would be bad <laughs> uh, uh, th this is this is this is the, the 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 why was i not consulted it's like great here is a, a group of people who are starting to have these conversations with a lens that is not from a state actor or a corporation um and this is a place where if you care about open data if you care about open source software uh, if you care about open and interoperable um, communications protocols, 
uh, right? And maybe I'll, I'll actually give a little bit of background here. Uh, my path to getting connected to Jesse was, was actually through a shared friend uh, who knows that we both do facilitation and collaboration. Um, but what had happened is that I realized that um, uh, Nokia had gotten the contract from NASA to put a 4G network on the moon. Um, and I started poking around and saying, oh, what kind of software are you going to be running? Is it an open comms protocol? Who's looking at this? Because really, that shouldn't just be like telco V2, right? And, and again, it's like, um, uh, it's Nokia running it under the auspices of NASA, which is a little bit different than your favorite local British Telecom or uh, Bell Canada, you know, running it in a commercial network. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, can I run an antenna on the moon? Uh, how do we do that as a people or as a public good that doesn't have to wait for a state actor? And that's when I bumped into Jesse and I'm like, oh, okay, you are convening these discussions. I'm so glad this is happening. How can we help? That's nice. <laughs> also starting to convene those discussions. And yeah, actually I, I don't, I'm not uh, in, in my sort of like um, notes for what to talk about today. I haven't brought in much about LunaNet, but remind me, um, maybe let's talk about this um, a little bit after because uh, there's quite a lot to say about it. And obviously I think, yeah, you know, um, networks and communications uh, is a topic of shared mutual interest. So. Um, is, yeah. is that helpful, Gavin, in just sort of painting some of that picture? Definitely, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, and it actually does relate to, so maybe I'll, I'll um, go back to the talk for a few minutes and then we can sort of um, expand out into the <clears throat> broader conversation. Um, but on the sort of back, like maybe raise, rising one level up uh, back to this notion of, of publics uh, and sort of like public goods. Um, we basically, what we're seeing is in the lunar environment, um, for a lot of reasons that, you know, you all were just mentioning, um, we don't really have that notion of a lunar public yet. And so there's this really interesting moment where we can actually think about what does it mean to constitute the lunar public? And, uh, we have sort of developed a series of hunches about, this and I imagine uh, folks in this group might have some thoughts about it. Um, first of all, our, our like our meta hunch is that these topics need attention uh, and development. That there are different kinds of publics and different kinds of goods, and those will involve very different dynamics, governance needs, and failure modes, incentive structures. Right. In short, they're going to need different mechanism design. Um, and second of all, um, we tend to conflate public goods in an economic sense with public utilities or infrastructure. Public infrastructure creates a public benefit, uh, but might not be a formal public goods, sorry, public good in an economic sense, right? So a public good is, I'm sure we've all heard this a thousand times, it's non-rivalrous and it's non-excludable. And when we say non-excludable, that means uh, that I cannot avoid being a beneficiary of this resource when I'm part of that public. So something like a private toll road um, is clearly not a public good, but it's certainly public infrastructure. So we need to like tease these things apart. And that will also have really big implications for what it means to um, establish good governance. So uh, let's, let's actually talk about creating things for a public. This isn't just about providing uh, like access and use to some resource or service. That's the good aspect of public goods. But we really need to think about the public aspect of the phrase public goods. Something like so, uh, open source, like you were just saying, um, I think is a really good example. It's obviously a great thing. It's available to the public at large. But if I, as a software developer, just sort of decide to release, unilaterally release some piece of software I wrote um, as open source, that act alone doesn't constitute a public. And so what I mean by that is that when I release this software, an engaged public doesn't somehow just manifest from that act, right? There isn't a feedback loop that is 
manifest by that. So to me, this is really interesting because then what is a public and how do we get one? And there are all kinds of political and economic definitions of public. The important thing to emphasize, I think, is that across all of them, there's some common features. One is um, basically a shared identity, uh, like a public life. Publics produce and reproduce themselves together, right? There's a togetherness implied in the notion of public. And the second is that they have a say. There is a feedback mechanism, for example, through governance. Uh, you know, democracy works in all. Um, governance doesn't have to be representative democracy. And there's infinitely many kinds of governance. And that, of course, is another place where DWeb, crypto um, are really sort of taking the lead on innovation, I think. Um, and if, if you don't have voice, or even sometimes when you do, there's also the mechanism of exit. So in an environment with you know, a growing number of public goods, exit is an option being exercised more and more. And I don't think we know really what the implications uh, will be of that yet. Actually, there's a great, this is, it just happens to be next to me right here. This book is, um, if, for those who haven't read it, it's a short little, like basically long essay, not very long at all. Um, and it's, it's a really thought provoking piece about um, uh, you know, the trade-offs between exit and voice. Uh, but we do need one or the other, right? We need exit or voice and preferably both for this public to exist. And voice is not just about everyone having a say on everything. <clears throat> Should every human have a say in every activity or decision on the moon? Presumably not. On the other hand, if governance and decision-making is limited to those who are literally present, then we will have a very limited set of perspectives represented. And we don't want that either. So the middle ground uh, is something around this notion of cultivating stakeholdership. So we think that if we do that well, we can go beyond the open source example of uh, just sort of like free benefits to say a Gitcoin model. That is, we can go beyond throwing things over the fence to building real relationships with the moon and activities there. And in doing so, I think we'll see like an organic development of inclination and capacity to engage in this feedback loop, right? To assess trade-offs and incentives needed to be basically citizens, a polis. It's about building capacity to participate in governance, not just act as consumers. And we think that the engine for kickstarting this kind of relationship and capacity building is in the introduction of public services and utilities for the moon. This can be many things. Uh, the most common ones would be, you know, power, water, or of course, communications, which I think, you know, we're all interested in. Public utilities involve the qualities we were just discussing of public life and accountability uh, to and for that public. <clears throat> so by building, supporting, catalyzing, public lunar utilities, we believe that we will see a progressive constitution of new lunar publics. And we think that this kind of emerging world with ecosystems of often public goods and services is very much aligned with what we need to do in space and what is happening in the Web3 world. And that uh, doing this will also involve development of tools that we can use for thinking about governance aspects of other global commons such as the internet or climate. So bringing it back together, and I think that that can actually in some ways be the underpinning of a discussion about, you know, more specifically about comms side of things. Um, but just to wrap up uh, my comments here, I would say that Open Lunar is developing policies for the moon, but really we think of it as a policy platform for 22nd century institutions. We think that finding ways to catalyze lunar public utilities will be an engine to constitute lunar publics themselves, including bottom-up mechanisms for public life and for having a say. <clears throat> and this is not, by the way, about living on or being on the moon physically. It's about being engaged with the moon and having a relationship with it. And the moon itself can be uh, our Petri dish, our opportunity to create new templates. And some of the discussion I, I'm interested in having um, here today is also about what design patterns folks are seeing, um, how, how to build engagement in governance of these opt-in publics, 
as well as uh, the failure modes that we're seeing. Or like, where is the notion of the public or public goods being co-opted or perhaps just used a bit lazily, right? Like everybody's talking about public goods, um, but that's a really easy way to kind of feel great about the thing we're working on. Um, but uh, it's unclear if there's a sort of technical notion of public good or public life or accountability in these kind of claims to public goodness. <clears throat> um, and then I think it would also be neat to link that to, and, and I'm happy to talk more um, about uh, yeah, LunaNet and what's happening in the communication space. Um, we just finished a, a pretty extensive study of upcoming, uh, current and upcoming missions uh, for lunar communications and standards and all of that. So happy to talk about that too. But I think that's basically all for me. I have a list of like references and other things that I can share with, with Boris to maybe send around, but um, yeah, that's it. Uh, amazing, super inspiring. So uh, uh, raise a round of jazz hands uh, for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, questions, uh, feel free to unmute and just ask it directly if you'd like. I've, I've got a question. So I'm completely with you until we get to the DLT piece, um, okay. which you, you mentioned a, a few times as a, a as a kind of potential um, instrument. What's drawing you towards that particular technology hammer in this case, um, rather than other mechanisms uh, that are you no know, that we that we have kind of at scale as well. Um, well, maybe I might have just not communicated it that clearly, but uh, I'm more seeing it as an analogy um, than something right. we're, we're reaching for directly. <clears throat> we might, you know, I'm open to using it, but uh, yeah, I actually agree with your your sort of gut reaction, which is um, the the level that we're focused on is more the kind of like the conversations, the convening. Uh, the figuring out what it is that people actually, you know, the coordination mechanisms themselves and the implementation. Yeah. I think that's that's like an implementation detail. Sure, um, no, no, that's good. I'm glad I asked because yeah, there's a there's it's it's quite a steep learning curve I'm going through here, kind of getting <laughs> understanding what you're doing. So many things, it's fantastic. So I, yeah, I might ask stupid questions along the way. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like that's like I I basically was just like Jesse, can you please come on and like tell us everything. <laughs> uh, to get a baseline. It's always the um, best way. Yeah. Uh, for, for me, again, the, the piece that is that is interesting in some of the stuff that Fission is working on, um, and Gavin, this is the first time you've been on, on one of these and we didn't do a big Fission intro, but um, the Interplanetary File System, or IPFS, is a joke, not joke, um, about that, in fact, you need a bunch of new tools if you start thinking about communications and data sharing uh, across vast distances with latency and, uh, and a bunch of other things like this. So uh, what I have recognized and what Fission is excited about with IPFS in particular uh, is IPFS um, is not distributed ledger technology. It shares a lot of building blocks as it shares with distributed systems. Guess what? If you do interplanetary communications, that is a distributed system. Never mind crazy things like uh, speed of light shift. Um, Brooke, uh, who's the co-founder and CTO of Vision, has actually been writing about um, speed of light on Earth because it actually even matters for communications there. And that led us to start thinking about what the needs are in space. IPFS is a commons network. It already is. Um, it's best effort. People run it. You can access it. Um, and it relies, it has no built-in incentive mechanisms. It uh, relies on... Um, uh, a really interesting thing where basically if people care about data, then they need to uh, run a node to keep it available. The flip side of this is built into the system is that anyone that cares about the same piece of data can help keep it online. And this has really, really, really interesting properties. I have a number of archivist friends who are we're diving deeply into this now. Um, and so... Uh, that led for the basis of thinking about, oh, we've got a commons network here that we're thinking about and figuring out what to do with, including things like, and Fission helps run the IPFS operators group, um, legal entities that exist in the world who run software are liable for things like, oh, in this country, that data is not allowed to be hosted. 
Um, and so this IPFS operators group, among others, are coordinating and saying, we're going to come up with tools and frameworks at a level higher than the software, although some of it will include software, for self-governing, governing in, an, in a way that we need. Uh, right. So like this is an example where, where I hope everyone can see, oh, here's some similar patterns. And might we take some of these things both at the protocol level and at the governance level and start sharing some of these Petri dish experiences? Yeah, and I think that's a good, um, I mean, uh, yeah, that's a good point. And it makes me want to like qualify my answer a little bit too, which is that we're not, I would say we're not looking to blockchain or, you know, distributed ledgers as the solution, but you could see where uh, in an environment where like, let's just take registration. There's um, one of the five main um, uh, outer space treaties is called the Registration Convention. And there's a commitment amongst nation states and to register basic parameters of space missions. Um, you know, they have national registries and then those national registries are aggregate up to United Nations registry and it lives on a website somewhere in the UN. And um, that is a centralized mechanism for registration. And right now, one of the topics in the lunar ecosystem is that th that registration process and the information that's re requested of registration uh, involves basically like orbital parameters. And so we don't have a way of registering activities like surface activities. We only have ways of registering missions or orbital missions, sorry. Um, so, you know, you give like orbital parameters, um, but there's no provisions for kind of ongoing updates when you don't, when you can't just like propagate an orbit. <laughs> and so, uh, now there's this whole thing of like, well, do you do you want to just set up another UN registry? And when you have so much activity that is, you know, going to start happening, is is that practical? And anyway, you could see how something like um, using distributed ledger as a register as a, the like technology layer of a registration mechanism could be like could be another solution. I don't know that it's the right solution, but it's, it's yeah, if I come back on that. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of IPFS as well, uh, but. Uh, I think there's so many interesting questions. I was sort of jumped on this when uh, it was Danny O'Brien suggested I kind of connect uh, with with the, this group. And you know, there's so many parallels here with in the astronomical community or the science communities. You've got these supranational collaborations, which are very uh, focused on the outcomes. It's focused. It has a particular um, you know, the sort of international science community have very specific problems they're trying to solve, which require this kind of massive uh, collaboration. But uh, as you mentioned at the, the beginning of like, you go down one layer from that to a, uh, a state actor or, or, or a corporate actor. And the, the closest parallel, I think that, that we're colliding at the moment with that entire system is around what's called scope three emissions. It's looking at the supply chain, um, environmental impact. Uh, and it, like everyone's saying that, oh, we need to measure our global supply chain environmental impact in order to combat climate change, but then nobody can do it because we, we trip over ourselves at every single possible step of the way. Um, and so I think there's something in the, in the sort of governance piece that I just wanted to pull out, and I know I've been sort of spamming on the, chat as well to art projects but i think there's a really deep cultural set of questions in the mix here which i find super interesting as to the, the approach that you're taking here embodies a particular culture but embodies a particular way of doing things which as you've highlighted already clashes with certain countries and how do we even build a kind of cultural frame of reference into which to have this conversation. I think it's maybe totally. I think that's address. a great question. And and I, I mean, I think we should go to Peter, um, but I'll just say that I think that probably comes back to like slowly and, you know, deliberately building, it's like back to that notion of building publics, right? Like how do we build a sense of identity together? You don't just like, you know, proclaim it, but you build the relationships, you do it over time um, and you build a culture that is kind of endogenous to those activities in that, that location. Um, but sorry, Peter, I know you've been waiting for a while. Um, i go for it. Yes, I was wondering if you've had any conversations with the Charter Cities Institute or, say, the Codex 
Legal Technology Research Group out of Stanford? Um, we have, um, quite a while ago, we were talking with some of the Charter Cities folks, actually more from my kind of, uh, I would say like intentional communities <laughs> life than, um, than Open Lunar directly. Uh, but it's definitely been a, um, it, it's, it's been a sort of like metaphor or analog or like something that we've conceptually like thought about a lot and referred to um, their work quite a bit. So I'm, I'm following it, but we don't have any active collaborations. Um, and if you have any suggestions, it's totally open there. I think what's really interesting is uh, I'm really glad to see David here. We we had a little chatter about Wardley mapping before this. Um, um, I'm collaborating with David as he designs the Protocol Labs network, which is uh, attempting to build a set of ne networked organizations. So I think all of these themes have some similar things that Jesse you alluded to. You're like, oh, that's actually my like other other life where you and I also share some interests around co-building and co-housing and co-working and it and, and all of these are actually elements of the same thing I really like this language which is new to me about uh convening a public or building a public um and and being intentionally it, it, being intentional about it and thinking ahead a little including looking for stakeholders that may only get access in the future and building in some concerns early right like uh I feel like I fell into some of this in open source 1.0, web 1.0. Um, and with hindsight, I'm like, oh yeah, we really screwed X, Y, and Z up, right? Um, I think with open source and the, the, that label, I mean, even just what what Peter was saying as well and, 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 and Gavin about the cultural piece, one of the things I'm noticing a tool in my toolkit in facilitation is on conferences. Um, mm -hmm. And I was part of a wave of tech people who discovered unconferences in the mid 2000s and did a, a range of them. Um, and I find myself talking to a lot of people today who have no concept that one could have a meeting where it's not just talking heads and audience, that there are other modalities. And I think all of this, it just behooves us to understand and help share some of these tools and techniques. Yeah. yeah. I, I know one of the things that's consistently ringing here for me really, really centers around this notion of like us making sure that, you know, as we're thinking about ideas like governance, as we're thinking about ideas like interaction and culture and community, that um, there are like there are examples of um, what I would call, I'm going to use a bad word, and I'm sorry, but paradigms uh, where um, the, the output was um, both consistently more than the sum of its parts and resulted in something um, emergent that was just never you know, possible or practical before. So like what I'm certainly on the lookout for, and you're ringing like sort of all of my challenge buttons, um, is in the, in the construction of those communities and the enablement of those communities, preparing, like preparing ourselves for what will inevitably become um, known future, and I'm going to call, I'm going to use the word conflicts, um, but, but Peter actually spoke to it um, pretty um, directly in one of his statements, you know, like asking about a sovereign state, like doing something against, say, the interests yeah. of like, the, like, a, like a, a celestial body. And well, like we um, just saw with the ASAT test, right? Like, yeah, you know, that, exactly. that was a direct example. Yeah. And, and my, my perception on that um <clears throat> re really centers around um like what what i would call um cultural gravity you know so there, there's a certain point at which if we can if we can engage a, a community like this it once it starts to create and build its own life the the uh, ability for actors like that to be able to execute successfully will become less and less to the point where um the actual act itself um would be um, considered antithetical to the progress of a given celestial yeah. body. And, I, and I'm wondering, you know, as we're thinking about the, like the, one of my challenges is like, how do, we, how do we prepare ourselves for folks to use um, platforms like this in ways that we didn't intend? And I don't have good answers. I mean, I've got lots of challenges, um, but these <laughs> conversations are the exact right kinds of conversations for us to start solving these problems together because ultimately we're gonna to have to figure this out because we're building the future on top of what we have now. And we know that we wanna abandon some principles. 
Yeah, wow. and uh, I mean, great comment. And um, I totally agree, two thoughts on it. One is, um, I think that it, c- culture, that notion of culture is is the thing that, um, that the, the like traditional institutions, you know, world A or like what, you know, whatever you wanna call it, uh, default world, traditional world, uh, doesn't tend to have really good language for or like know how to um, see, you know, like, I don't know if anybody's read Seeing Like a State uh, by James Scott, but, um, you know, like we sort of reify and rationalize the world into these kind of institutional boxes a lot of the time. And that doesn't leave a lot of room for, for a kind of like formal recognition of culture development. And actually, this is another thing that I'll maybe share a link on, but a, a project that I'm working on separately from, uh, I mean, it informs my work at Open Lunar, um, is something called um, Extitutional Theory Development, which is uh, an idea about basically studying the dynamics of uh, sort of so- social dynamics um, through re- or recognizing that institutions are essentially, they're not a container for social dynamics, they are a lens into social dynamics. But like any lens, you know, they filter out some things that they also don't know how to see. And so if we like normatively construct the idea of institutions as a lens rather than a container, then we could say, well, what if we could normatively construct other lenses? And we think that we could construct a lens, we're calling it institutions, that would be able to see these sort of like social dynamics and work to formalize them um, in ways that could help us learn, you know, how to, how to like care and feed for them <laughs> more effectively. Um, anyway, so that's a whole separate project, but um, I wanted to come back to the question of conflict because I think that's, you know, a bit where like the rubber meets the road and we can have all these like, you know, conversations about coordination and oh, isn't it great? But, um, you know, sometimes people will just, will break the rules. You know, sometimes there will be a conflict. And so first of all, like, you know, I learned this from the intentional communities world. Um, often we correlate um, failure with that means it shouldn't have happened. Uh, you know, like if a community, um, you know, like some crazy experimental intentional community has been around for 10 years and then it shuts down, everybody's like, see, told you, not like, wow, you had 10 years of learning, like, oh my God, you know, you must have gotten so much out of that. And so um, similarly, when we're looking at new domains of human behavior, uh, I think it's really natural for us to look for like the ideal solution or the, a perfect solution. Um, and if it has kind of, um, if it's possible to have conflict in that solution, then it's like not the right solution. Um, and so maybe just to remind ourselves that um, there will, in general, you know, we will have conflict. And if we have conflict, it doesn't mean that the whole, we should throw out the baby with the bathwater, that the whole system is, um, you know, is not is not a good one. Now we don't have a system in the first place. So um, it's just sort of like, a, you know, maybe it's a reminder to be kind to ourselves and, and like try it, try it out and, um, and see what happens. Um, but then, yeah, the, you know, to go to the really specific example that Peter, you gave, um, you know, I think this is both true of uh, China and the United States right now. You know, Peter's question was, has anyone thought about what would happen if China decides to ignore current space law and deploy a military lander to assert sovereignty? Um, you know, I think uh, practically speaking, um, a couple things could happen. Obviously, there would be outcry internationally. Um, but from there, what you're likely to see, like it's going to be a calculation on the part of these major you know, na- space actor nation states. Um, what would the follow on from that be? Like, what does it mean to assert sovereignty? Who's going to recognize that? And if it leads to, say, the collapse of the Outer Space Treaty, which is you know, been enforced for uh, six, 50, 60 years. Um, how is that, you know, good or bad for them? And so most of the major space actors right now are generally making the calculus that, um, that the Outer Space Treaty is better to have than not to have. <clears throat> and it was put in place, it's really an arms control treaty. It was put in place in order to avoid the situation where these countries were putting in nukes you know, on the surface of the moon and then claiming it for their own. And they were both worried that the other would do that. So, you know, it basically like, it expands out into broader geopolitical questions that, um, you know, that I think we will see, we will see playing out in the coming years and uh, the ways in which that could happen without claiming sovereignty are just that, 
you're starting to hear a lot of plans from China and the United States about building up infrastructure on the lunar surface. And because, as I mentioned, we don't have any rules about, uh, do you have to tell people where you want to build your base? And, you know, do you get like a license for staying there for a while? And you have to be a certain distance from other people. So you can imagine that because these things happen slowly, somebody will go, you know, probably to Shackleton Crater in the South Pole, somewhere around that. You might have a couple of different, you know, bases in the same region, but they'll probably be naturally a little bit far apart from each other so that they don't interfere. And there'll be this like, you know, awkward kind of uh, standoff situation and nobody will actually break the rules. They'll just sort of like push up on them and kind of do what they think makes sense. And, and, and I think this is a perfect example of what will happen is you will only have two nation state actors uh, communicating in a way that they're used to unless forced otherwise. And I think this is the stuff that for me is something that I'd like to participate and push. We are now seeing things like pirate parties, uh, political parties forming in various nations. So I will say this thing, what does it mean um, for some of us who care about some of these open principles and participation by a public that is not just state or corporate actors? to potentially have a seat at the table, potentially literally starting with the teaspoon of regolith, uh, so that we literally, uh, 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 the, the discussion must encompass a non-state actor in there as well, uh, right? Like, I think that's that, I'm like, that's, is that kind of how you're thinking about it? Because that's what I'm reading out of this, that, that we should work towards that. Absolutely. I mean, I think you you um, hit the nail on the head and brought it back to the breaking ground trust, which, of course, is our sort of like nascent um, attempt at prototyping this. And uh, and yeah, I mean, what does it mean to be like, first of all, what I think is cool about the trust is that you have this legal accountability and it, like I almost think of it as like a like a micro state, <laughs> um, not that the goal is to replicate states, but you have the, the formal like structure of the trust has these trustees, these trust stewards are called, but it also has uh, a role, um, I'm blanking on the name now, but it basically has like an independent role uh, that is assigned legally in the sort of like structure of the organization itself that oversees whether or not the trustees are doing their job. So just like, just like you know, a country has like the judiciary branch and the executive branch, the trust kind of has this like microcosm of that encapsulated in its functioning. And so from that perspective, I think that's a really neat kind of scaffolding for non-state stakeholdership and decision-making, where if you bring people into a decision-making process within that trust, then the trustees have to have to kind of re you know, support and reinforce it. And so if you build up processes like that outside of, say, the UN, and not, not to compete with the UN or to say the UN is terrible, but I mean, it has its limitations as all things do. And so I think it's important to be complementing that with with these new approaches and that's what you know you know the trust can at least teach us something about who knows you know where it will go uh, so we're just after 10 a.m um and uh, i want to be respectful of folks time um uh lunanet and so the two things that i still want to cover briefly is lunanet and a final one uh how can we or anyone who wants to help um, yeah, uh, I can say a few things about LunarNet, but please like interrupt me if I'm kind of going not in the direction that is interesting or useful to you all. Um, LunarNet, so the outer space environment, of course, uh, involves, this is probably stuff you're all much more familiar with than the other things I was talking about, but we're going to have longer time delays uh, and we're going to have not necessarily continuous uh, connectivity. Um, in an environment where you have like yeah, occultations from planetary bodies and stuff. So for a long time, um, outer space networks like, you know, communications to Mars, et cetera, uh, have used a concept called delay tolerant networking. And um, there's been a working group that actually Vince Cerf of all people is, you know, um, has helped to lead the development of what's called bundle protocols that are being proposed for interplanetary networking capabilities. Um, it more recently, um, NASA has a basically a, a program um, that is developing the co a concept called LunaNet, which is essentially just 
um, it's not a mission, it's a set of standards that they're, they're kind of like holding the conversation around the development of. So it's, it's sort of, I would say like maybe 60% specified. Um, and the, the, I would say the proposal is for standards around, um, you know, frequencies, uh, but also packet structures uh, and um, kind of like the stack hierarchy, if you will, um, of, of how messages will be formatted, um, but also what kind of low level messaging and services will be offered. So you could imagine in the space environment, um, you might want to offer something like a really low level like if you're familiar with uh, like the ACK protocol, <laughs> right? Like you might want something like ACK protocol, but uh, for positioning information, which is very different than like, I want to like package up a whole bunch of, um, I want to like use a kind of deeply nested packet structure for communication that needs to go all the way back to earth and needs to be very robust. Uh, so that kind of like thinking, like teasing out that stack is really what's happening now um, on a technical level. One of the things that we um, observed quite clearly in the study that we just did this fall is that there's this really cool conversation happening about standards. And then there's um, you know about five or six missions with communications uh, like focused intentions over the next five years or so planned. And, and those conversations are not necessarily linked, which is a little bit, um, like scary, not in an existential sense, but in a like, whoa, this could be a big loss. Um, and what what is happening is not very surprising, but you have commercial operators in particular who are like, yeah, we heard about LunaNet. Yeah, sure, we wanna be compliant with it, uh, but there's no like sort of central conversation that's that's taking that, com that question to the next step, which is, okay, great. So are you gonna implement these standards? Or are you at least going to make sure that you're backwards compatible or forwards compatible with those standards as they get uh, matured? Um, so there, it's like they're they're happening and there's good intention or like these two things are happening and there's good intention, but they're not actually doing this. Uh, so I do think that either what we'll see is, um, you know, kind of that like collapsing of the wave function just through early actors who um, probably use slightly older standards um, uh, called CCSDS. Um, but I really do hope that we'll start to see more conversations happening about um, actually implementing standards. And, and in particular, it's not just about the standard, right? It's also about things like peering agreements or like, you know, if you have a commercial mission and I have a commercial mission, um, are we just competing with each other or are we actually relaying each other's packets and information? Um, there's another organization that I was going to mention for kind of more technical folks. It's called um, uh, LSIC, the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium. And it's uh, funded by NASA and it's run by um, uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. They have a bunch of technical groups that are looking at everything from like surface mobility to uh, communications um, standards and networking. And it's a really cool place to get involved in. I mean, it's like super, super in the weeds, everything. Um, so, but if you're interested in communication stuff, uh, there is a very small working group. It's about the size that meets once a month um, and talks about these things. Anyway, that's like, that's a starting point. Um, awesome. But I'm curious what questions you have. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that, that's great. A lot of this is sort of info dump level. Uh, so to be uh, other uh, surface, other things um, I've connected Jesse, with the Falcoin Foundation. Uh, Falcoin Foundation has Marshall Culpepper, who is the director of off-world applications. Like clearly part of his was like, sure, I'll take this job, but I have to have the most awesome title. I'm like, amazing. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Fission as a participant in the protocol nat labs network, which is like all of the people in, in kind of the extended space um, uh, would like to support some of those things. Our um, uh, decentralized authentication protocol uh, lets you do things like offline authentication, which will be important when you're running applications at the edge, when the edge is the moon, because we're not going to do round trips to mm, Earth yeah. to check to see if you have permissions. So that's the technical piece. Um, uh, uh, I would like to sponsor slash have someone work for Fission that we haven't quite identified yet, but looks like you know, a visiting applied researcher who knows Fission Stack, knows IPFS, knows content addressing, and uh, brings some of those concepts to things like LunaNet um, and experiments with how 
um, some of those protocol stacks might work um, with a strong lens on open source. Um, and I think another lens on, um, we very much think of it as applied research where it's like, yep, we're gonna have to figure some stuff out. So who else can we do a plug fest with to make two systems talk to each other, right? So, that, right? so, so that's a goal for the entire like year um and and yeah. kind of that's that's what we're thinking about right now and and uh hope to uh keep introducing people to each other in this space um sounds like maybe the seeds for that uh for some kind of <clears throat> uh cross organizational space dweb working group something something uh, so uh ideally this is uh that is what i have floated uh, the protocol labs network does not yet have a protocol for surfacing working groups, but like like rough like it's 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 building publics all the way down, right? Like, uh, but uh, that's what we hope to have. That it's uh, you know it's it's cross organizational, and um, you use some of these principles of open space technology where everyone is welcome. The right people are in the room. If it's not working for you, no problem. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll add some intentional community thinking in there too. Amazing. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm trying to look up um, to David, your question about uh, like edge approaches to technical challenges. Um, uh, you know, the, the main answer is no, like not at all, because people are just trying to figure out like, you know, hello world, uh, rather than some, some of the, these concepts, which obviously could be really useful. But there's a project called CryptoSat that I was just reading about that is uh, I'm trying to find the, I mean, I found the link to the, the project itself, but there's an article that explained much more, much better. Um, what, some work that they're doing, it sounded really neat. It's basically like um, cr uh, cryptographic primitives as a function of the delay, like, you know, provable delays based on speed yeah. of light can give you yeah. some primitive that you can do. Um, other things with it. They didn't go into much detail, but I was like, oh, that's really cool. Um, but I, yeah, let me see if I can find the article. For, for you those, building oh, physics, David. yeah, build, building physics into your confirmation algorithm, that's a definite plus one in my book. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Some of the, oh, the so verifiable delay functions, uh, time based cryptographic primitives using communication delays. I'll paste the link. Sorry, go ahead. I suppose like the, the, the core challenge I, I've been thinking around centers around this notion that like one of the risks you run into when you when you tried to build the new on top of the old, like those hello world concepts that you were just talking about, um, some of the risk comes from using the same modalities uh, and limitations of the past to try to you know, like manage the future. And we always have to do that anyway. You, know, you can't just throw out, we can throw out knowledge, but it, it, it's oftentimes unwise because you never repeat the same mistakes. So um, the, the, the thing that I'm wondering about is, is whether or not some of the frontier tech that's being worked on in that space is being considered um, in the development of those protocols, because, um, you know, like, let's be honest, right? Like, how valuable will that CryptoSat company be if entangled communications become instantaneous between celestial bodies? Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, I agree. Yeah, and 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 so the, I'm I'm interested to see whether or not there's multiple tracking going on in that community because my suspicion is is that we're going to have to use what we know now for for now, but I, I'm wondering how close to um, you know a level of efficacy that it can actually be used that that type of tech actually is. Yeah, and I um, I think that those communities um, like on the cultural level back to that. <clears throat> Are, are not connected uh, yet. So I, I guess like there are there are a few crypto projects that are like actually Lunar Outpost is a company that is partnering with, I'm just looking at my sort of notes here. Um, they're partnering with an organization called, what is it? Um, Copernic, Coper a pernic space <laughs> uh, to do to like tokenize payload space. So this is not communications at all, uh, but it's like these little um, prototypes of bringing this kind of um, you know decentralized technology into the space world and seeing how, you know where is it useful 
um, and where is it not? Like, where does it actually advance the kinds of um, capabilities or behaviors we want to see? And where is it just sort of an indulgent, um, you know, I don't know, project, fun play project? Yeah, and, and, and in fairness, um, it's it, it, like it's a non-zero percent chance that um, in, entanglement produces no net benefits if information can only be propagated at the speed of light. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, one of the other things that we uh, are are going to do likely more in the latter half of the year is do um, sort of a future of computing conference. Um, and um, I think the working name uh, that I want to use for it is causal islands. Um, because in fact, distributed systems and speed of light is, uh, uh, is a big thing. And of course, the the islands of, of life and polities and public as we spread around is maybe an interesting metaphor too. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask everyone to give a big round of uh, jazz hands and woohoos for Jesse. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this Thank has been lovely. Um, Great chatting with you all. Hopefully we'll get to chat more about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We have a whole list of links. Uh, we'll put them up and, and send the notes out afterwards, which we always do. Uh, the okay. recording will be shared. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, and uh, I'm going to hit the stop recording button. Thank you. Amazing.